Hi, Joe. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you. And great having you. You're, we're, we're, we're really excited to, to dive in with you just with your experiences uh, that really, you know, cross so many different fields in a way of when, you, when we think about just like indigenous healing methods and spirituality and modern science and modern medicine. And so we're excited to dive in with you. Um, I, I think a good launch pad here is why don't you just share a little bit about, why don't you give us a quick kind of explanation of just you know, a little bit of charting your journey here of yeah. learning, maybe take five minutes to just talk through like where you came from and what you got to today. And maybe you could also pull in a little bit of the epigenetic research stuff in that too. Sure. Um, sure. So yeah. Give us like a, a kind of quick summary of your overview. life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, family medicine doctor and I, uh, after family medicine, I, I was interested in integrated medicine. And I, I did a research fellowship at UCSD Department of Psychiatry uh, under Dr. Paul Mills, who's now the uh, the research director for Deepak Chopra. He was a psychoneuroimmunology, you know, focused researcher. So I was exposed to that world, and around that time was around the time that I started getting more interested in going down to Peru. I had had major experiences with peyote in Arizona, like in my own personal healing from a depressive episode. That really made me interested in psychedelic plant medicine, spiritual plant medicine, sacred plant medicine. And so my family's from Colombia. So I had the opportunity. I knew about the ayahuasca, you know, yaje world down there. And I eventually went down and got very involved, you know, ended up helping start a healing center there in New Erao Centro Espiritual and worked there. Went through the training and the apprenticeship and traditional Shipibo kind of format under Ricardo Amaringo. And to become ayahuasquero, to run ceremony. And I uh, wrote a book about it called The Fellowship of the River, you know, which one of the ideas was the integration of, of biology, emotion, and spirituality and, and different, the shamanic and the Western style. And that came out of that. One of the big ideas that came out of that for me was the possibility that epigenetics would be a, a way to focus on, to try to capture the profound spiritual and emotional healing that I was witnessing down there. And we were looking for a way to do that. I was inspired, you know, through ayahuasca visions and my training to pursue that and through my experiences. And so I wanted to pursue that. And, uh, you know, I, I talked about this in 2013 at the MAPS conference. I was invited and this is the idea I proposed, you know, hey, I think we should look at this. And, and Joe, uh, just and a clarifying question here. So when yes. you were thinking about epigenetics, was it about that you wanted to offer another lens on proof of what was happening to people? Is that what you mean by when you started thinking yes. about epigenetics? Yeah, another lens on proof. So it's also another um, avenue in our understanding of of biology. So in other words, there's this element of, you know, for example, emotional trauma, you know, that that is uh, something people will accept, that that's some kind of energy you know, if I just go ahead and use that term, you know, just to be more um, thorough, in fact. And and so when people have a PTSD, let's say from Vietnam, you know, and they've, they have this altered physiology after such a trauma that no one would deny at this point the altered physiology. However, the mechanism of how that physiology got altered, at least, you know, molecularly, is a mystery. That's just something people just gloss over and we widely accept. So we kind of deny that this emotional energy is, is real. Meanwhile, we know that this person was fine before. Now they're different since that time. And something stayed with them. Mm -hmm. So then we, we can accept this possibility that they were imprinted somehow by this trauma or conditioned. Their biology is somehow conditioned by this trauma. And then this might stay with them for some period of time. And, and then we see this alternate experience where people, in the case of the work that we were doing, like shamanic work, you know, we, we was, whether or not, you know, there's so many different lenses to look at this stuff. But we were working through that lens and approaching people in a spiritual context, in a traditional, uh, you know, Shipibo context, that we were seeing these transformational healings happen around this trauma. 
And the Shi peoples are talking about cleansing this energy, you know, helping people release this energy, people transform this energy. And now, now we hear about that maybe again more with somatic experience and and the idea of like kind of cathartic release or you know, whatever that is. But this idea that there's this transformation that happens that the Shi peoples would discuss in a very spiritual context, the way such things have been discussed for thousands of years across the planet Earth. Um, but then, you know, more kind of clearly, I guess, to everyone more universally is this reality of a deep emotional healing that that person went through. So then this transformation that we were witnessing in some cases, you know, there were, there are implications and with my background in psychoneuroimmunology or exposed to that field, cases of not just mental health resolving, but physical symptoms, you know, resolving. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, something's happening in the biology, like, you know, maybe we're not gonna, you know, something happened. So where did that energy come in and shift the biology or where's one place we might be able to in see that capture that and where does it leave mm -hmm. so the implications are for spiritual healing across the board for psychotherapy for all non-material modes of healing that mm -hmm. we are you know of course widely aware of and so then the idea that could some of that be facilitated by let's say psychedelics or sacred plant medicines like what is what is their role in i don't know like somehow deconditioning as terence mckenna put it you know deconditioning agents that could facilitate you know transformation at that level and where would that happen in the biochemistry because i think that would be really important for me like down there to show the peruvian government and the colombian government you know mm -hmm. uh, at the world the planet earth that has kind of scoffed at these indigenous healers from the Amazon, you know, and now people are coming from all over the world to receive healing from them. And I, you know, was a witness to that as a medical doctor from the United States with research experience, seeing powerful transformations. So I thought that was, you know, a really big deal. To capture there was difficult with a laboratory or refrigerators or saliva shipping, you know, it was just a mess. And so we talked with friends and talked to maps and said, why don't we try to get the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy? They're seeing that kind of transformation that we've seen down there, mm -hmm. where somebody who had this PTSD, uh, you know, chronic uh, treatment-resistant average, you know, 18 years or something, you know, mm -hmm. of, of chronic illness. So this is somebody that me as a family medicine doctor would just shine on, and as they've been shined on by their entire experience with the healthcare system, that these people, we don't know how to help them. They're just chronically ill. That's it. Like, they're not going to get better. And so then they get, you know, last resort, they make it into psychedelic psychotherapy. And then you see, you know, close to 70% or in the high 60s. At the yeah. end of a 12-week intervention, you're seeing people no longer meeting criteria for PTSD. So to me, that indicates, like, something biological happened. Because, and then if you talk to the people, well, they're having profound emotional healing experiences. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you know, it's bordering into the mystical or at least spiritual. Or, I mean, we just, if we're open to listen to them and what happens to them during those sessions, mm -hmm. you know, if we're honest about that. So we, we asked that question, you know, we got some support and we're, we continue to raise money. We need more money to complete the study, but we have our first set of results. And yeah. It does seem to be the case. We, it looks like we're going to publish hopefully soon that there are genes that are known to be affected in PTSD by trauma that are epigenetic modified, you know, in a, in a correlated fashion to that trauma. And that then there's subsequent modification that from the healing process that correlates to their clinical improvement, you know, to their CAP score. Wow, that's really so that's exciting. A, for me, it's a really, really big deal. Like, I don't, I don't think yeah. a lot of people really appreciate like the biological significance of capturing, you know, profound healing and what it opens up for. You know, the tr you know, in other words, what's going on in those sessions? You know, what's the role yeah. of intuitive talent and skill? You know, that come brings to the table to move that kind of stuff to help facilitate that. You know, the caliber of the therapist that they've handpicked for the study. You know, right. this isn't just people from, you know, whatever, because they read the protocols. Right. These are talented individuals. And so gifted with working with yeah. this. So then we start opening the doors to talking about, you know, how, you know, whether it's placebo effect or conditioning or all these other factors that influence the process. 
and then augmented perhaps, you know, by the, by the medicines. So I think it's a really big deal that's going to open doors for integrative medicine across the board, you know, mm-hmm. to take a look at, you know, whether it's prayer or Reiki or energy healing or, you know, whatever it is that somebody's able to achieve something and see these shifts, you know, spontaneous remission of cancer, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, it's probably related. So to see that upswing, that this epigenetic programming that is uh, underlying so many illnesses, now more and more we're learning that at least there, whether it's not the cause, but it's there as a symptom or it's present. And to see that that software, you know, could be reprogrammed. Well, I just want to, I want to reiterate, um, I, I think you already said it, Joe, but I just want for emphasis, I want to reiterate how big this is because um, we haven't had, I mean, even a CAPS um, rating scale, which is, you know, you, you have to get a lot of training to perform a CAPS evaluation, but it's still subjective, right? Yeah. It's, it's still based on um, what the person endorses and what they don't endorse on the questions. And, and, and so, you know, what, you're doing is taking it to the next level of actually what what is happening in the cells um and, what's you happening know, we're entertaining we're, we're opening the culture to ultimately i mean i understand that the hesitancy around this but ultimately we're reopening you know metaphysics you know well, that's where the discussion is headed why does it matter so if we know this this epigenetic imprinting happens and you know like a harsh parenting situation sure you know or that 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 goes on how does that happen you know how does harsh parenting turn into that this methylation patterns you know that's real we know that's real and so the love the reality of love and the lack of love and the way the system responds to that starting to find little spots which is extremely important because so many people are so materialistic you know, they dig their heels in there. Uh, in my opinion, you know, it's uh, it's just fine. You know, that that became their belief system, um, that their comfort zone. But it it is really a unfortunately, sadly, it's kind of a hiding place from vulnerability. You know, to close your mind as I was saying, so to, to do this, what you're talking about. Well, they're going to say the cap score is just subjective, so right. forget it. That's nothing. Right. Right, who needs that? I don't need that. You know. Right. And so then that person, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, they need to see something in the flesh. And well, why shouldn't there be something? You know, we just didn't have the means to 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 perceive it. You know, so so they're yeah. right. There should be something there. Right. The materialist and argument that we can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, now, one thing, maybe I'm going way ahead of the, you know, the, putting the cart way in front of the horse here, but um, you know, you you you've seen and correct me if i'm wrong that with with ayahuasca healing um you know some of it is is um you could say uh you know there's trauma that can be healed there there's depression that can be healed there um what we might call up here psychological um issues that 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 may be a shit people healer would think of as more of a spiritual condition uh, but I've right. also heard stories of cancer and and um, other kinds of things that we would up here call physical illnesses, right? And well, in the uh, book I present, you know, uh, a few physical cases. And I mean, I, there wasn't a cancer case, but there are reports of that, you know, um, for sure. And uh, just briefly in the book, you know, how there's a psoriasis case and a Crohn's disease case and a, you know idiopathic chronic cough case and a migraine headache case. That's maybe there's a little gray area there. You know, and then this chronic pain and chronic fatigue and, and those kind of syndromes. And then, yeah, then eventually the, the potential for something like, you know, when you when you see this radical remission, like this book, Radical Remission, about people coming out of stage four cancer or beyond. And you talk to, I talked to the head of UCSD Integrative Oncology because I had a family friend, you know, in that situation. And we were trying to learn about, you know, what's, what, what's the right direction and, and what radical remission reports and what he reported in his experience dealing with late stage cancer is just the radical remissions, like the psycho spiritual element is crucial every time. Mm-hmm. Like they, the people that have overcome at that level, like in his experience, they always had to do that work. It has to be that component. And that was a radical remission. And they're kind of uh, the, the, that woman that's pooled all these cases that you studied, 
you know, it's like eight of the 10, you know, mm -hmm. uh, factors that were consistent across the board. Would you expect to see changes in, in epigenetic, you know, epigenetic changes in, in, you know, oncological genes or, or that Epi kind of thing? Uh, Cancer is an epigenetic problem. Like, I think that's, it's one of the major areas of focus as of, of epigenetics, because you're seeing this idea of like, okay, we're talking about modulation of the expression of genes. So mm -hmm. why is this oncogene being expressed when, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be in this cancer situation? Because somehow it's epigenetics has been modified in such a way for the expression to be, you know, altered. Mm -hmm. So cancer is largely epigenetic. And uh, autoimmune disease is like huge body of research of epigenetic, you know, related causes. And then, you know, uh, mental health. Right. Like that's, pro that's right up there competitive. But I would say cancer is, is one of the fields that they're saying, yeah, we need to put a lot more energy and understanding into this. I mean, you meant, you said something really interesting to me of sort of looking at epigenetics as software. I mean, are you thinking of it as sort of software switches um, where it can change the code of like the software, mm -hmm. basically the, the program? Well, what it changed the way the G DNA code is being expressed. So the simplest example, like the most obvious example is two different cell types. So you have the cell, your red blood cell and your neuron, and they have the same DNA, you know, exactly, right, as far as we know. So then each one is, is imprinted in the differentiation process and programmed to express its genes differently, you know, to the favor of the expression of certain proteins over others and all the rest of the magical, you know, alchemy involved. So, so that's the first one. You know, another big example for people to kind of see how, like, this has just been a totally underappreciated part of biology. We just weren't aware, like, of this, but that this is actually how the DNA-based life form works, that it's integral. There is no DNA-based life form without epigenetic apparatus. So right. the software is the programmable part. The hardware is the DNA code. Yeah. So you have the, that's why I use those terms, you know. So, yeah. so the reprogramming of the, the expression, the way somebody like uh, Bruce Lipton, you know, biology uh, of belief. Biology belief, yeah. He talks about it like the, 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 the contractor. The DNA code is a blueprint, but then you have a contractor that reads that blueprint to adjust it to the environment as needed. Yeah. How would you frame with your understanding now of, I mean, we know a lot more now, obviously, about epigenetics than we ever did. And, we're, you mm -hmm. know, we're in a very new conversation right now, right? Right. Um, in the last, right. even the last 10 to 15 years, really different yes. conversation. And so I'm curious, like, just talking about human beings and mental health and wellness and resiliency. And where where are you at now in the conversation of kind of the nature and nurture conversation? When, with your now, your knowledge of epigenetic expression and you know all this stuff like how do you now frame that conversation well there's there's you know the nature element is there you know so that's kind of like the dna code destiny of your genes etc cetera, etc cetera. so there there is that element and on top of whatever like inescapable genetic stuff or or uh you know tendencies vulnerabilities and then there's this whole new in-between zone that we thought was, it looked like it was genetic, you know, like this, but it could have been epigenetic. And yeah. we didn't realize like to what degree the epigenetics maybe could be modified to reduce such vulnerability. So an example, and I don't have any epigenetic data on this, so just like an example of like a profound uh, healing, you know, was a guy that came to that I talk about in the book, Crohn's disease case, you know, with lifelong history of severe Crohn's disease, you know, bowel perforation and all this terrible, you know, two, at least two surgeries with bowel resection, severe disease. And then, you know, here we are in integrative psychiatry, like as a family medicine doctor, we never really dig that much into this Crohn's disease. You know, they go to the gastroenterologist, but, you know, there are all this data around the comorbidity of Crohn's disease with psychiatric, you know, right. mental health disorder, like, in his case, major depression and, and suicidality, you know, alongside it. So then he had, a, I think it was a two-week, you know, experience in, in New Way Rao. 
and a, like a complete resolution. I mean, we're talking bloody diarrhea daily with severe pain. So it's like a, the objective measure, as I say, is the bloody diarrhea. You know, there we go. Whoever doesn't believe them, there it is. And now there's, it's not there anymore, you know, in two weeks from this profound process. And so then I talk about in the book, like as I dig around into Crohn's disease and you see, oh, there's this, there are, first of all, there's this comorbidity, you know, with, with mental health problems. And then, yeah, we all know there's exacerbations with stress. So sure, we all accept that, you know. So there's, how do, you, how do we explain that? You know, there's this energetic strain on the system. And then there's this neurogenic inflammation like process that I discovered that, oh, okay, this is where, you know, autonomic nervous system and some kind of psychological disturbance could, in the absence of any external environmental insult or infection, generate, you know, an inflammatory response as it does in many cases of Crohn's disease and how that could you know, be, I guess, turned off, you know, by the nerve activity was different. And so there's some kind of biological shift and all the mechanisms are there to, to describe that possibility, including like very well articulated mechanisms around the generation of neurogenic inflammation of the intestines. And so, you know, somewhere in that system, something changed in the way things were expressed. And so that's an example of this, you know, biological shift. I mean, he doesn't need surgery anymore. He doesn't need that kind of stuff. So, so there's an example of how it happens uh, at a level that, you know, people, maybe it's more visceral, you know, for them. Um, so I don't I know. I kind of went too far and I think I forgot where we started with that question. <laughs> no, there's, there's an extension here, Joe. I'm, I'm glad you're, this is a great example to build off of. It, it brings up for me, uh, the work of, um, you know, intergenerational trauma and the sure. epigen epigenetics of, uh, for example, Rachel Yehuda's work, who's, she's now involved with yes. MDMA therapy and uh, studying Holocaust survivors and their offspring and their offspring. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in your work in, in ceremony um, in Peru, is your sense that, what, what is your sense of that as far as like, what do, are people often working in, in ayahuasca ceremony with uh, trauma from previous, in the lineage, previous generations? Sometimes, very you know, sometimes, so there, and there's different ways <clears throat> that that can manifest, you know. So when you're doing that kind of work, uh, so, okay, we can accept that, the epigenetics, that there'll be, as Rachel Yehuda, you know, has been a big proponent and explorer of like, hey, there's, you know, we should start looking at epigenetics with PTSD. You know, she said that a long time ago in a paper 2009. And then since that time, you know, evidence keeps building, sound argument. Um, and so, you know, what, and then there, so the idea is, okay, these concentration camp descendant, you know, uh, concentration camp survivor descendants that have higher prevalence of anxiety and depression, that, you know, people would say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's the parenting because they're, they're concentration camp survivors. And then she's claiming that, hey, there's this evidence that like there's this epigenetic imprinting that they would correlate to the trauma way back when. And that's still there, you know, this conditioning. And so and there's other examples of the rodent studies and like that. So how do you what does that look like in, in ayahuasca ceremony? So as we start exploring in psychedelic psychotherapy, like this, this bigger potential and the opening of this space and this portal, you know, which is just at the beginning stages because we're trying to FDA approve, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we get back to the, what's going on in those sessions, you know, like that's pivotal. So then for us in the ayahuasca world, well, what goes on in those sessions is everything we talk about, you know, that's the focus of the, of someone, of, oh, it's a big focus of the work. And so when somebody is doing like ancestral healing, ancestral line healing. Like there's so many versions of that. So one of them could be as simple as uh, somebody, la, la, like, you know, at a recent experience that I had, they had a lot of trauma with their father. Father was a PTSD, you know, from war. This is somebody from Asia. And, and you know, really tough situation, a lot of bad turns in his life and becomes this very controlling, abusive uh, parent. And then the mom is kind of out of the picture and she grows up like that. And she just has so much pain and difficulty and resentment, you know, with her father on top of the trauma of that experience growing up that way, you know, kind of a PTSD of sorts and constant repression emotionally of 
can't cry, can't laugh, can't do this in the way that, you know, blunts so many of her experiences. And then her healing around that ends up being about, you know, with ayahuasca, something that happens sometimes and something that happens with other experiences too, is that she, you know, gets to walk in his shoes. She gets to feel, experience his experience. Somehow she enters his experience and becomes aware and conscious of all the conditioning and trauma and everything that, that made him into this thing that she didn't understand why, you know, why would you ever treat me like that? And now all of a sudden, she gets some kind of glimpse of that. And then in that is some kind of acceptance and forgiveness is made possible. Now she understands. Now this bloodline that she is, the daughter of her father, that she's afraid of becoming her father. I don't want to have anything to do with my father. I want to reject that energy. And now there's a new opportunity and a whole openness and a, and a love and a warmth that comes across the dimensions and makes her feel like totally shifted in her experience of self-love. Hmm. So, yeah. you know, what is that? So, yeah, I mean, those are the kind of experiences that I'm saying, yeah, that probably has some epigenetic uh, implications. Right. You know, I understand why people don't want to hear that or they're uncomfortable with that, but they are, we already know that love, like I said, parenting love and the lack of love does it. You know, meditation can shift it. Altered states of consciousness can affect it. So it's it's a subtly, it's a very subtle um, part of our biochemistry that is impacted by profound emotional experiences. Like, I don't think we would deny that. What I think people yeah. haven't really considered as much is profound, you know, positive emotional experiences potentially as well. You're reminding me, so... Maybe I was 20, probably 20. Uh, it was like my second LSD experience. And I'm Jewish is the background here. And uh, I spent an hour just seeing SWAT stickers everywhere for an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, they weren't there, obviously. I was just seeing them everywhere. And, right. and you know, at that time, I was, um, I didn't have people to process with. I mean, this was, you know, 25 years ago. And, it wasn't in a situation to process that, but um, it's you now, of course, you could just say, well, I've been exposed to that in this lifetime and this and that, like just being Jewish. But, you know, there was something I knew in that moment that something was more old about the yeah. experience than than just how old I was at 20 years old. I knew that it was a lot older than me. And it just, you know, what you're speaking about here is um, about this kind of mystical realm that actually as science is catching up, it's not that mystical <laughs> in some right. ways. It's actually very explainable. And I think over time, it'll become a lot more explainable about how um, kind of time is very connected over time. Like, you know, history is connected to the present and there's there's a connection in us and um, that it's it's magical, but it's also... I think we're we're starting to get a language to make this a lot more understandable, and it's it's kind of like use use that word understandable about epigenetics. So maybe just talk a little bit more about. I'd love to hear too about just your experience of the mystical component of the medicines, and if we're talking about yeah. ayahuasca or other things, and then how it's actually it doesn't have to be so um, far out and allegorical and and so maybe there's other dimensions, like maybe just talking about it in an understandable way. Sure. Well, I think that, you know, the reality is it's like, you know, some of these things you have to experience it yourself, you know, to, to be more open to it, you know? And so a lot of people coming from whatever background they're from, you know, they may have a lot of resistance or fear about, you know, some of this stuff, whereas like somebody from another culture, maybe they wouldn't, you know, they grow up talking about mystical things all the time. My family is Colombian, you know, it was very like common to talk about mystical experiences and the role of our dreams and, you know, all that kind of stuff is just was so welcome and, and real as well as emotional energy, you know, 
And so, so that was just, that was a part of the conversation growing up. Like every so often people would just be talking about that, like in your community and people would just start speaking that way about, you know, the mystical and, and dreams and yeah. 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 I would say that's part of like a lot of the planet earth's conversation. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. a, 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 you know, it's a little different version where that's been closed off and you know, in my experience, like with the mystical and like, you know, having ultimately compassion for people when you realize, well, they've never had a mystical experience or or they've never been, you know, but this understandable thing we were just talking about or whether we're going to explain it or not. Or really, it's like for the culture, especially the academic culture, to feel comfortable enough to open up about this. Like it's actually everybody that I've ever met has had some weird stuff happen to them. You know, and with their intimate people, they'll say all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but then it's, it's this idea that that's unprofessional. And so then yeah. I would say that that lack of that lack of professionalism, that attitude, which, you know, we can understand or they're trying to clear out some charlatanism or things like that. But it runs a little deeper because it's like. Because when you, when I, in my experience, back to the little bit of the mystical, taking somebody from, uh, you know, some some medical school faculty that decided to come down to Peru's anyway, Rao, and you know, didn't want to tell us that, and then they go through their experience and they're very, you know, closed and uh, you know they don't know if it's working or whatever. But then you you get them into a, a situation, and I don't, I'm not saying this is just ayahuasca. I'm saying this is like across the board of of like real, I would say, spiritual healing ceremonial healing where they're going to be safe you know you're gonna um, allow them to be vulnerable like really vulnerable not like this academic what i just talked about like that doesn't get anywhere in the ballpark that's nothing okay yeah that's not honest you know you can't talk about your family or you can't talk about your kids or you can't you know your life so anyways Yeah. yeah so to get them vulnerable and then there's no judgment. So there's spiritual practice involved for help people to, to, to get past that part of themselves, whether that's in psychedelic psychotherapy and therapy as well, to not judge. And when you hold a person in that space, to me, like some of the most rational, logical, you know, materialists, I would say very high percentage by the end of their time are starting to ask questions about the mystical experience. So yeah, and, there's and a, there's a, I'm just saying that I'm suggesting that there's a little more universality to it, right. you know. And so what we're trying to do, and, and we understand, and we're not, we don't want to be sloppy, and we want to be careful and professional. But you know, it's like it's to say that you can't talk about love and mental health. You know, as I've said before, that is a profound ignorance. Mm-hmm. You know, there is a role for wisdom in in our field yeah Yeah. i mean you're also pointing out it's uh it's sort of like this modern era where this kind of mindset that's happening in in different parts of the world of where the the mystical the spiritual the vulnerable um the deeply intimate has become labeled as crazy and everything That's else right. is sane. And everything else is sane. And meanwhile, uh, that sane yeah. voice is driving everybody off a cliff. Well, I think. I mean, we're seeing that, right? I mean, the mental health of the planet is not looking pretty right now in terms of where we're headed. Yeah, especially let's say, like, if we just focus on the United States, where they supposedly like you know consuming more psychiatric medication than anybody else in the world, you know, yeah. by apparently a large margin. So, so, you know, that's the Achilles heel. And so then what we see is, is this brokenheartedness that's behind what we're talking about, this resistance to get vulnerable. So it's like there's hurt and there's pain and there's trauma and then doesn't want to get vulnerable, doesn't want to feel more pain. And so we're not going to go there, but then it just gets worse. And so then that's the situation we're in right now. It starts to, you know, it's starting to bleed over. You know, the body says no, like Gabor Mate says, yes. you know, the collective flesh is saying, whoa, 
you know so that's and that's why people are turning to that's why people went to psychedelics you know in the 60s and started a part of it you know that was the exploration was they i need to go beyond my culture because my culture is 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 there's a conditioning process that's making me sick and so they turned themselves on to the eastern practices you know and yeah. meditative practices and then got connected to some indigenous shamanic practice and got exposed to mushroom culture from the mazatex and and now we have the ayahuasca and other forms of that because the culture within their culture, as I say, you know, the the problem is you're not acknowledging the emotional and spiritual dimensions of illness. Yeah. And by spiritual, if we want to come up with a more comfortable topic, like your your belief system, you know, how you believe your place in this life, like that affects your health. There's something that you you said a minute ago, Joe, that really got my attention around. Um, the brokenheartedness underneath it. And it reminded me of, um, there's a shaman by the name of uh, Martine Brechtel, who ha has written a lot about um, the our failure to grieve or our, our inability yeah. to actually feel grief. And yeah. um, so it just, it, it brings up for me this, um, what you were saying about North American culture, for lack of a better, you know, way to talk about it, as sort of like uh, the wrong view about that that grief is um, or vulnerability, whatever you want to call it, is actually not healthy. It's not normal. Uh, it's not part of every moment of every day, you know, to feel the intensity of what it means to be human. Well, we traded, you know, there was this, it's this risky thing. And you know, of course, our culture has many, many positives and so many wonderful things. But, you know, one of this concerns is that materialism to replace that pain. So now if you don't like it, mm -hmm. and you don't feel good. Well, then just we're doing it for the money. Right. Now, hey, nobody likes it. Hey, oh, Monday sucks. You know, like, hey, nobody likes it, but we're all getting paid. Right. So, you know, that that's really how like. Growing up from Colombia, my parent family from Colombia, that was the criticism. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you know how it is up there. You know, all mm -hmm. they care about is one thing, mm -hmm. you know, money. And wow. so the idea that the materialism is going to solve that stuff. Right. You know, so then we have these heroes of these billionaires and all these people, you know, that that's that's where we're all striving for. And they got to do it. So maybe we'll get our chance and blah, blah, blah. But then what do we do? Who's telling me about how many pills they, they take to sleep, how many pills they take to wake up, how many pills they do to, you know, to have sex, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, it's not really honest, you know, right. there's that element. So then the grief, it's like, well, there's the grief. And, we, you know, we, you can tough it out. And there's situations where you have to tough it out. Sure. So you've got America coming out of World War One and the Depression and World War Two. So this, you know, long period. And maybe there was a little pop up of like, whoa, we got a lot of emotional baggage. The 60s happens like we, we need to deal with this. And then it kind of like we didn't quite it didn't quite gain enough traction to say, you know what? We want to integrate this. Goes we want to integrate like this grief. So there was a research study at Temple of the Way of Light for grief, a loss of a loved one with ayahuasca and traditional Shipibo ceremony. And they had significant results that this was, you know, this is it. And Maladoma Sombe, an African shaman, does the same thing that you're talking about running grieving rituals as a west african like this is what these people need they don't know how to grieve so this idea of grief and grieving you know again if we dismiss it as nothing but then if we talk about it like this is an energy like this is a real thing like we don't process this and we don't release this transform this it, it it weighs people down and you know we know that and we're learning about that but since we didn't know we didn't learn in medical school how to help them grieve so then who's going to help them grieve? Like if we're, you know, in other words, it's not really part of the healthcare system. Right. You know, so what they don't, they don't they're where they're supposed to go do that really like back in church, you know, like that, that's where they were supposed to learn about that kind of stuff or in their culture somewhere from their family. You right. know, that's where you people learn how to grieve. And so we've handed over like our education to the institutions and they, they're not really prepared to help people grieve in some kind of, scale up you know system right it when takes I start, a lot more humanness when i start thinking about you know these tools that you know are 
maybe going to get approved, MDMA, psilocybin, maybe other psychedelic therapies. In the context of this conversation, it, it's having me pause about, you know, this this much bigger, much, you know, much deeper contextual challenge, which isn't about just, okay, we need better tools for dealing with depression or PTSD. We need actually a huge shift in our consciousness. Um, and you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you, we do. And and I would say like, okay, so now back to the shamanic and the mystical, and I know we drifted off that, but it's like, you know, here's that side. And so then I'm on that side a little bit. And then everyone's like, why are you dealing with the psychedelic psychotherapist? They're the big pharma is going to just, they just want to destroy everything. You know, there's nothing. And I'm like, well, you know, the people involved in this movement are, are people like, you know, Will and Keith. And that, that's who's, they're like the, the people who are like on the leading edge of the psychedelic psychotherapy are part of them. You know, one camp, influential camp is the ones asking all these questions. Why? Because they see that's what's going on in their sessions. They see that's what's going on in the healing that they're observing. So they're reporting back. Hey, I had this patient that they weren't getting better. You know, it's this thing happened. And then we did this and oh my God, then this happened. And then they talked to their deceased loved ones. And, you know, we, we, we allowed a little magic to happen. You know, don't tell anybody. And this beautiful thing happened, you know? Yeah. And so now they're, they're going to come out. So for me, like the, the MAP study, you know, with their publication and in New York Times and us, our, us piggybacking with the epigenetic study, to me, it's, it's great because there's so many, the culture isn't so totally corrupt, you know? That's, that's the other side of the, the culture is totally corrupt. Don't let the culture take it, <laughs> you know? And it's like, but what about these guys, these, these people, those therapists, what's going on in there is this message to everybody. Hey, you know what? I think we're going to need, we need to grieve more. Maybe we can figure out how to grieve more. So there's all that research coming up the pike, you know, grief research and gratitude research and, you know, all these interesting kind of, it's opening up so much more. And so this consciousness shift that you're talking about that we do need is happening. Like maybe not enough, but it, it has begun, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely the train has left the station for sure in terms of yeah. the consciousness shift. There's no doubt about that. And there's something new happening if we're talking specifically about psychedelic medicine. This is a new type of consciousness about psychedelics right now uh, that's happening in terms of thinking about it in a new way. Um, I, I'm curious for you about where do you feel like in terms of ushering this, if we just talk about even Western uh, society for the moment, in terms of ushering this in, um, do you think it's very important that it's really ushered in through medicine practices, like medical practices, and and ushered in through the psychotherapy field? Or do you think that the culture can handle it through decriminalization and ushered in that way? Yeah. So I'm coming from training in Peru. You know, my family's from Colombia. These things are legal there, you know. So that's I'm from that background. We're from a background where the war on drugs is the, the amount of suffering that that has created, you know, and, and is immense and horrific and terrible and, you know, apparently a sham, you know. Like there's no, there's no change in the consumption. And so this idea of like, so, so in other words, I'm ultimately like I'm for legalization of these substances and, you know, MAPS with their discussion of moving forward with MDMA, they, they uh, you know, was, they were following the marijuana model, which was that medicalization is the pathway to legalization like that. That is they've uh, they've expressed that, you know, explicitly that they're open to that and they're encouraging that. And so that being said, you know. Um, and with ayahuasca, for example, which is coming in my, my tradition, like I'm part of a church, right? The Church of the Eagle and the Condor in, in Arizona, United States, that's asking for legal permission for religious reasons, you know, as a spiritual practice, a spiritual healing practice. That should, we don't feel like we need to be, you know, just like as peyote is treated and, and the UDV and the Santo Daimi. Mm -hmm. So that these things are sacred medicines in the traditional indigenous culture where medicine is a term we use to talk about tools for spiritual healing. So where the, in that culture, they provide that context where the path of healing is about coming into realignment with our essence. And that involves spirituality, you know, with the mystery. And so that being said, you know, 
there is more advanced possibilities, you know, with advanced practitioners. So the people doing MDMA at the raves or at Burning Man, you know, they're not getting the results that MAPS is getting. So there's an educational process around harm reduction, you know, that needs to happen just like with alcohol. There it is, alcohol, you know, if we want to attack, you know, this terribly destructive thing going on all over the place. Um, harm reduction, you know, whatever, everything we can do to educate the people about safety. And then, you know, the reality of the mature understanding of this thing is like, yeah, just doing it on your, do it yourself and all that is, is some of it may be safe for that, you know, and that's going on. You know, I don't really have a comment, but in the case of ayahuasca, I would say that there's, you know, there's definitely risks involved that people should be made aware of and be warned about. It's not something to be taken lightly. So just because it's legal over there doesn't mean they take it lightly, you know, or that they should be taken lightly, you know. So right now, there's still a degree of regulation involved that we're trying to, you know, come under. And that being said, then there's there's so much further you can go with the advanced practitioners, mm-hmm. you know. Right. right. So it's like they're, they're little, like, homemade whatever's going on out there, they're not doing 20 years of chronic treatment resistant PTSD, you know? Right. Yeah. They're patting each other on the back and having a nice experience, you know? But then there's that, there's a, there's a, there's a reality around the dedication and the discipline, even like, you know, they're, they're always, they're going to come after me, the FDA, the DEA, oh, you're talking about medicine, 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 this is therapy. Come on. You can't say this is a spiritual practice. And for me, that's none of their business. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're in the Americas, and for us, that's medicine. They always call it medicine, always. Mm-hmm. You know, and that means spiritual healing tool. That's like prayer. That's like dance. That's like song. It's the same. You know, love. So for us, it's a spiritual practice, and it's for spiritual healing. And so we feel like that's a, that's an avenue. You know, there's a decrim avenue, and then there's a research avenue. Ultimately there'll be maybe legalization of a lot of these things and, and then there'll be a cultural issue. And I really think that that is the wisest way to deal with it. And it's also the, the reality because I don't see any limitation on these substances currently. And not, I'm not talking about ayahuasca. I'm talking about mushrooms, you know, for example, or, or, or MDMA, you know, it seems pretty widely available for the people that are seeking it. And so I don't know what is actually being, yeah, I would I would totally agree in terms of it's 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 sort of a political conversation when we get into decriminalization because you can access these substances mm-hmm. right now if you want them you can go find them um, and so it's to me that's um, I, I I really like what you're saying there and uh, and then I also just you know to me there's also the because there's a lack of holding contextually around these substances in in at least we'll say the united states for the moment there's a lack of holding about the spiritual transformative nature of these substances um the it does open up when it's not held well it does there's different risks involved when you engage with these medicines when it's not held well i think that's the, that's the best way to say it. No, no, that's very true. And so perhaps it's best that there's this transitional period, you know, before we go to full legalization where we can learn about it through the medical model, through the spiritual model. Let's say in this case where, you know, I'm going to have to apply, you know, to show myself and that we're doing everything as safe, you know, and as sincerely as these other paths that have been given the DA exemption, you know, that you have to answer to some degree of scrutiny in order to, at this stage, right? And then decrim, you know, that loosens that. But again, you know, I support it because I think that there's still, we can still educate people about these risks that you're talking about, you know? And, and, you know, there's a shift. There's a shift around personal responsibility. Like, Mm -hmm. just everybody, you know, it's tough. There's young people and, you know, everyone makes mistakes and does crazy things. But still, you know, we, we have to be careful with ourselves and, and encourage each other. And so the more we educate, you know, people would say, bring, in the case of ayahuasca, like coming out in the open, as we have people come at me and they're like, Joe, why aren't you speaking out against these people that are, you know, running ceremony bad and leaving people messed up? You know, like Keith is talking about, you know, really screwing them up. Well, what I'm, you know, 
well, do I want them to go to jail? Is that, is that what it is? Or are they going to put me in jail? Cause I go out there and say that. So, yeah. so there's no way to have the dialogue right. unless I come forward and put myself out there and say, okay, here we are. We want to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. So let's start talking about it. So unless it comes out of the closet, it's in the shadows where so many dark things happen around this stuff. You know, that's a whole Absolutely. other risk. Here's a whole nother dimension, Joe. And I think you're, you're well positioned to, to answer this question and not many people are, but, um, the question about the shift in, um, in traditional ceremony and the way, I mean, it sounds like your training, uh, is very traditional, uh, in Peru. And I, I have huge respect for that. And, and as ayahuasca comes to North America, um, inevitably there, there are shifts, even in people like you who have been trained very traditionally, you bring your own experience, right? You, 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 you have a Western, you have a North American point of view to some degree. Yeah. Yes. So what is your thought about like, um, is there, I've heard, sometimes I've heard more traditionally oriented people say, well, you know, if the, if the ritual isn't held in the traditional way, um, then the medicine is weaker or that there's something else happening. Um, uh, it yeah. seems inevitable well, that these a, rituals would get updated over time. And they have been. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And they have been for thousands of years, in yeah. fact. Yeah. So that story, you know, with a written record of like the great-grandparents, the great-great-grandparents, you don't, you know, yeah. they told you they did this. So there's a mystery on the other side of that. That's the real and when you get into like for me in tradition and you're you kind of become part of a lineage, right. you know, you realize that it's like, of course, it's modified in, in the generations, yeah. you know. Right. This is an apprenticeship program, apprenticeship system, like, you know, karate or kung fu, or you know, I mean, these things evolve or the yoga, you know. So there's there's all these different perspectives. And so, you know, there's issues around like this was a big hot topic. I don't know if you're aware, but in Sacred Plants Conference with Bia Labache and the, and the sure. Chakruna, you know, I was the yeah. moderator for this two, you know, the FDA versus FDA trial versus or, or in discussion with, you know, indigenous activists from Colombia and Brazil who were from, you know, and, and Bia's questions were challenging them. Like, well, you're very, this orthodoxy that you're preaching that nobody else from outside of the culture should do this. You know, it's like, okay, that's one perspective. So then the reality is though, that the indigenous perspective is quite diverse across the Amazon. So just within the Amazon, you have from Brazil all the way into Colombia, Peru, et cetera, all these different tribes with very different styles. You know, yeah. it's not consistent like Colombian uh, Yahe ceremony versus Shipibo ceremony, big differences. Sure. You know, and they're going to tell you this is wrong. And if you do this, you know, that's you're going to go to hell. And the other one's going to say the same thing. And, and so you have to weigh that. You know, and learn. And when people come to me with some of that, like, you know, cultural appropriation or you're doing this or you're doing that. And then they'll tell me, well, they told me, you know, my teacher told me you're not supposed to do that. I'm going, I heard that guy speak. You know, he spoke at this conference and I also they stood up and said, and no women, you know. So are you is are you on board with that one, too? Because that's (laughs) that's part of their orthodoxy (laughs) that you're telling me is the, you know, divine plan. Right. That's the divine plan. You're the one that knows. So, so there's room, I'm saying. There's room. And so I'm, I'm open. I come under fire for, for being part of ayahuasca tourism and, you know, being part of that whole thing and then for, for coming here. And so for me, the way to try to address that stuff is, is through, you know, this acknowledgement, through this real people discussion, a human discussion. So like I talked about there, you know, people, they criticized me. Some of the people that were there talking, you know, they were telling me, you're off. But what I, you know, I brought this medicine, Ricardo, I'm an English people healer. He's a Russian people, whether you like it or not. And he tells me, yeah, Joe, I want you to do this. Go there. Bring it. It's going to help. They need it. Mm-hmm. I go. I share my medicine practice, my spiritual healing practice with uh, some Navajos, mm-hmm. you know, some Diné. And they receive great benefit. Mm-hmm. And then they want to go in their culture then they feel inspired. I want to go down there and thank them Mm. for teaching you and bringing it to us. Mm. And so then that's the old way. That's the indigenous way to like, how do you close this loop? How do we deal with this stuff? You know, we have to have dialogue. We have to have consensus. And so, you know, that was the beauty of that event because they did end up having to talk to each other. 
And, you know, it came at the end of the conversation. You had the, you know, the white ladies from America saying, you know, we don't, we're not trying to violate you. You know, please, we want to keep talking to you. Mm. And then the other side, like, well, we don't. It's not that we want you to go away. It's just, you know, <laughs> we need to, we need to, let's talk. But come on, like, hear us. Yeah. You know, you're not you don't hear us. You're mm. just rolling over again. And mm. so mm. it's yeah. it's there's so much more possibility to deal with these delicate topics, even though some people will be very, you know, with the yoga or whatever it is, the Chinese medicine, you know, yeah. Bruce Lee bringing Kung Fu to America, you know, these are different things. Um, sure. But there's just uh, so much more possibility when, when all the voices are at the table. Right on. Right on. That's the way to deal with that. It's like, yeah, they, they, no one's, they say no one's listening to us. That's why we're angry. And the proof is you're not listening to us. If you're listening to them and they're there to talk about their opinion about what's going on, whether that's the inclusion of peyote and, and the decrim movement from the North American, Native Americans or whatever it is, you know, these people's perspective from their tribe in Colombia, they want to be heard about FDA research with ayahuasca. Hmm. Once you have the voices there, then it's a little different, you know, then yeah. it's like easy for people to criticize and throw stones and all that. But it's engaging. really that's really helpful to to hear your point of view there, Joe. And mm. yeah, I mean it makes sense. I mean, there's like a lot of different perspectives, and if if some are not included, then we're headed for trouble. I mean, and and then and, ultimately, it's like, what's the motivation? Like you're saying, if we're if we're bringing medicine and healing over, yeah, you know, well they're criticizing me, you shouldn't be doing that, and you know you're out of line. Then oh, and then what all the other things, and then then I got these people. I just help them, you know. It's like, well, beautiful. The other one's talking, you know, and over here we're dealing. Here's what we're dealing with. So it's you know, there's some of that ideological stuff is political once again, and right, you know, it doesn't always hold water when it comes down to like the heart of the matter, which is trying to to share, you know, some healing and some right. spiritual connection and growth. Right. Well, as we as we begin to wrap up joe um we'll make sure that that we get the links from you uh for yeah. the research and how to support you and what you're doing and we have a, a question that we always um like to ask uh as we wrap up and and uh and so here's how it goes uh if if you had a billboard that everyone on the planet would see one time in their lifetime and you could put a couple of paragraphs on it a few sentences what, what would you like for them to see hmm my message right now is uh, first, you know, the path of healing is, you know, coming back into alignment with our spiritual being. Mm -hmm. You know, the next one is spiritual healing is spiritual practice. You know, this whole, I hit on it a lot because it's going to come into my world, this therapy versus, you know, spiritual practice. Spiritual healing is spiritual practice. Spiritual practice is spiritual healing. That's the entire purpose of spiritual practice mm. is to nourish our spiritual well-being. So our ethical understanding of what is bona fide spiritual practice should be measured by its implications for our well-being. Mm. So once we bring back together you know, that spirituality and health are the same thing. And that is actually uh, important for the sustainability of our earth. Because all the sustainable cultures, they recognize that. That's a crucial part of their consciousness that somehow allows them to live in harmony with, with the nature. Love it. Thank you. Joe, thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thank you both. It's a lot of fun. Great to see you guys. Wonderful, Wonderful having you. Yeah.